I have a uh, long review of this book uh, that will appear in the summer issue of the Journal of Mormon Studies, um, excuse me, Journal of Mormon History. Uh, and you will see there that my appreciation for this work is no less than any of the uh, expressions of appreciation that have occurred here. So I will not uh, elaborate further. And Jana, in fact, has seen an advanced copy of that review, so she knows uh, how I feel. <clears throat> the author opens this fascinating study with a question of Mormon exceptionalism, referring particularly to the church's apparent success, comparatively speaking, in retaining its membership across generations. She finds that such exceptionalism seems to be declining in recent generations, but especially among the millennials. In reviewing her findings more generally, however, I think they require us to consider other aspects of exceptionalism as well, and especially the future prospects for any kind of exceptionalism in the LDS case. As a lifelong and practicing member of the church, I would welcome a continuation indefinitely of most Mormon exceptionalisms. But as a social scientist studying long-term trends, I anticipate a future Mormonism with its exceptionalisms considerably eroded, not only in membership retention, but also in its traditional requirements for membership status itself. If historical precedent is any guide, the LDS exceptionalisms that remain will likely become more symbolic and cosmetic, but less likely to produce fundamental tensions with the outside world. This expectation comes simply from an application to the Mormon case of the typical historical pattern in which new religions begin with conspicuous rejections of the ways of the world and strident demands upon membership for various kinds of conformity and sacrifice. But then with the passage of a few generations, if the religion survives, it does so by gradually relinquishing its exceptionalisms and seeking greater respectability in the surrounding society. In thinking about the changes in the church's doctrine and policy during the past two decades, I see evidence of precisely such a quest for greater respectability, and in ways that converge nicely with the preferences of today's millennials, given their more laid back tendencies toward church attendance, obedience to authority, personal moral values, and other traditional observances. This seems especially true with the changes of the past year or so, all of which bespeak greater flexibility, reduced demands on time and resources of the saints, and greater appreciation for their social and political sensibilities. In my uh, forthcoming review, I raised the question of whether the millennial generation described in this book is actually creating a new culture of Mormonism, one that will grow to become the Mormon and to some extent part of the American cultural mainstream, somewhat as the post-polygamy generation did a hundred years ago. That new Mormon culture of the Heber J. Grant and David O. McKay era, however, was curtailed in its development by the retrenchment era that followed after mid-century. Future retrenchments, if they should be undertaken, will prove much more difficult than any such previous efforts. In the internet age, attempts at information control are largely futile so it won't help to circle the wagons. I expect the church to continue seeking to maintain 
an optimum level of tension with a surrounding culture as a survival strategy, just as the author suggests in her concluding chapter. But in the future, this strategy will probably not occur with alternating eras of assimilation and retrenchment, as in the previous century, but rather through smaller and more frequent course corrections of the kind we've seen in the present century. The membership retention issue raised by the author is another matter. She cites the data on retention, excuse me, she cites the data on retention across generations, but there is another at least equally important measure of retention, and that is the retention rate for converts. Both of these retention rates, however, depend ultimately upon periodic cost-benefit calculations by members, whether or not such calculations are conscious and explicit. Furthermore, these cost-benefit calculations can change drastically across time and cultures. A generation or two ago, joining the church could be quite costly, sometimes economically, but especially in strained social ties and new behavioral constraints. Yet in the 1940s, my missionary companions and I in New England succeeded in, bring, succeeded in bringing eight new members into the church. We worked with them each for several months, and they all remained as faithful members to the end of their days. By contrast, for the past several decade, decades, it has been common for new members to be baptized within a few weeks of the first contact, with very little evidence of enduring commitment and teaching to the teachings of the practices and practice of the church. Not surprisingly, many such conversions do not last even a year. Thus, the retention rate for new converts has been even less favorable than the retention rate across generations. <clears throat> Meanwhile, getting out of the church can be as easy as getting in. Unlike earlier decades, when a formal church court was required, um, John earlier made reference to degradation ceremony, and that's kind of what it was. Um, but in, in those days, um, the formal church court was required for ending one's membership, and important family relationships might be at stake. But all that is required now is a letter to the bishop or stake president, or even more common, simply walking away with no forwarding address. In other words, LDS membership has become a matter of easy come, easy go. Enduring membership and loyalty to the church as an institution now depend on the cost-benefit calculation that each member makes from one year to the next. Costs and benefits can be either those of this world or those expected in the next world but some combination of the two will be determinant, though both costs and benefits might be quite different for the millennials and subsequent generations than they were for my generation and earlier. It will be interesting to see what sort of cost-benefit calculus proves to be effective in the future. The data in this book suggests that worldly politics are likely to loom larger in this cost-benefit calculus than in the past. We've heard that idea reiterated in this conference. The political conservatism of the American Mormon mainstream has proved a major issue for former Mormons, and even the millennials are far less conservative than their parents. Yet the criticisms of traditional church policies about race, about marriage, about women's roles, about LGBT rights, and about sexual norms in general, all happen to express the values and interests of the contemporary political left. 
So it should not be surprising that today's conservative church leaders would be slow to make the changes called for from the more progressive segments of the LDS membership. Finally, let me suggest a more dramatic issue that might be on the horizon, namely the potential for schism. Like all new and evolving religions, Mormonism has faced periodic schisms. Actually, any time a religious denomination contemplates a drastic change in policy or practice, it faces the potential for schism. If it moves too far toward greater assimilation, it risks defections from the conservatives. If it makes no changes or not enough changes, or even moves back toward greater tension with the surrounding society, it risks defections from conservatives, excuse me, from progressives. I see the potential down the road as the LDS Church continues to deal with its LGBT members, their family members, and their allies. I see that, that potential for schism. Certainly we can see the schisms over this issue occurring in many other denominations. There's a parallel here, or at least an analog, to the church's predicament with polygamy. The nature and future of marriage is and was at stake in both cases. Both have been incredibly complicated in, by the traditional LDS teachings about the role of marriage in one's ultimate salvation or soteriological status. Both issues have been fraught with deep and heavy emotions. And as we've heard, um, politics is increasingly apparently divide, uh, uh, driving religious commitment instead of the other way around. Given that context, one wonders how far the present and future LDS leadership might be able and willing to go in accommodating LGBT members and their needs and particularly whether or not LDS theology has the flexibility that can ratify the fundamental changes required. Until we know the answer to that question, schism remains a real prospect, in my opinion. Now, having entered the 10th decade of my life, I've lived through almost the entire second half of Mormon history myself. <laughs> I've seen many changes that I would not have expected. Yet I know the church will look very different by the end of the present century, with or without the frequently promised return of Christ and the millennium. Thank you.